So uh, the, the cyclical uh, time uh, paradigm was, uh, was universal. You found it in, in China, you found it in India, of course, but it was there in Greece and Rome, and it was there in, with the Danu, and it was there with, with uh, many other peoples. Uh, I think all, in fact. So the, uh, the time cycle is a part of the heritage of humanity that only uh, was uh, jettisoned by the Roman Empire and, uh, and the, uh, the Catholic, uh, let's say, uh, mm, bastardization of Christianity, the changing of the real teachings of uh, Rav Yeshua, that, that uh, took time as being linear. There was still an end time, so it was a limited uh, time. And, and in the same way in the Jewish tradition, a, a linear time, but a time which uh, was, was known as a Heilsgeschichte in the German uh, version of that uh, uh, understanding as, as expressed by Martin Buber and other uh, Hasidim. That, uh, that although time uh, entropically leads to a decline, not a progress, but at the end there is the time of the Messiah and there will be a world to come. So implicitly the linearity is uh, still cyclical and you find that in the mystical Christian uh, mystics as well, the, the, uh, the more esoteric teachers. Uh, who are uh, teaching theosis, the divinization of man, is the return to that. And you find it in the Quran as well because of Adam being considered the first and highest prophet who had all the names, as we heard recently. So uh, that knowledge returns and therefore the paradise, uh, which is the environment of the Adamic being, is... Uh, becomes remanifest, and they did have the understanding that the first uh, yuga, which is called variously the golden age or sat yuga, krita yuga, satya luga, uh, yuga, various different names, but it is also referred to as the solar dynasty, as as the second age is the lunar dynasty. But it wasn't uh, that these people worshipped the sun. No, that was a much later fallen state of the remembrance of that. It meant that they were in a state of total consciousness, that they, their, the consciousness of every inhabitant of the golden age was literally the, the light of the sun of suns, the, the source of the light that creates the universe and, and that manifests as the sun and the stars and all of the uh, heavenly bodies and uh, uh, the celestial light that is a, uh, a reflection of the supreme, supernal light. So the understanding of the solar dynasty is the complete consciousness that is independent. It does not require a reflection from another as the moon requires the light of the sun. So once you get into the lunar dynasty, you already have a shift from non-duality to duality. The duality is still a high one because the moon is is full or mostly full, but it is, uh, it, it is still uh, a fallen state. It is a state where now, rather than being in Atman consciousness, they are in soul consciousness. And then in the Copper Age, the soul and the ego are together. That's one reason why it's called Dwapur Yuga, the, the two uh, towers, the two powers of uh, soul and ego are in a uh, relationship that the ego eventually becomes dominant and represses the soul and that begins Kali Yuga. So we have a, uh, a cycle of time, but it is clear that in the Sat Yuga, 
time stops. There is no sense of time because every being lives in the present and lives egolessly. And so, and lives in a state in which uh, the world and the self are not different and the world is perceived directly as light, as the emanation of consciousness and not different from consciousness. So there is a non-duality and uh, a sense that all that is is uh, a, not even a dream, but a, a, a perfect reflection in space of the uh, information, the beauty, the power of the self, and that it is the self, that the world is internal to the self, not other than the self. So the, the consciousness uh, then gradually shifts, and by the time we get to uh, Kali Yuga, of course, uh, the ego is embedded in duality. It, it has a split mind. It considers the world to be separate and objective and different from consciousness and outside of consciousness, even though it's very clear that nothing is outside consciousness. You couldn't know anything that was outside your consciousness. But there's a belief, and it's a religious belief that's called science, but it's a religion, that we're, we are actually in a world that exists independently of us. Because consciousness is identified with bodies, and bodies are temporary phenomena that come and go in the world. They are part of the impermanence of the flux of time. But the consciousness remains present even though it becomes unaware of its presence because it becomes lost in thought. And as soon as your consciousness becomes lost in thought and you believe that that thought is what you are, I think therefore I am, as, as soon as you become lost in that, you live in the past and the present because thought is all about that. Wishing that the, the past was still here or that it didn't happen, but having some relationship, nostalgic or horrified by the past and some fantasy about the future that is either positive, hopeful or, or negative and fearful. But the ego is always uh, ping-ponging between these and is never present. And so it feels a lack of being because being, the real, is only presence. And the ego never knows presence because in the present it dissolves, it dissipates. And so the mind continually chatters because it is terrified of its own dissolution, its disappearance into a presence that is so awesome and so, uh, so full of energies that the ego cannot tolerate it. It cannot tolerate the bliss that would show up if you remained present for an extended period. The, the ego would uh, begin to uh, dissolve and all that would remain is presence. This is the whole point of meditation, but very few people meditate in such a way that the presence remains consistent and unbroken long enough to dissolve the sanskaras, the latent tendencies of the ego mind, so that uh, the ego pops back after the meditative uh, formality and, uh, and is never uh, dislodged from its uh, fictional uh, condition as a character. But the presence that is beyond the, the fictional uh, entity that one comes to believe one is because the belief that the mind has reality and represents one uh, takes over as uh, the implicit religion of the ego itself that cannot be uh, undone or seen through by the ego because it is based upon that and it dreads 
it's uh, uh, knowing its own lack of reality, of essence. So it is only in moments of trauma when one becomes speechless that one knows presence or moments of divine love or being hit by a lightning bolt of shakti uh, or, or one is filled with that supreme presence to the point where the ego dissolves completely that one has the, the sense of what the real truly is. So time itself changes its qualities as it goes on and consciousness becomes more dense and the world, rather than being a dream, becomes uh, something that is all too solid and all too resistant and, and all too filled with uh, uh, danger so that uh, it has to be experienced uh, by beings who remain vigilant and on guard and using their minds to calculate their way of dealing with reality and trying to get whatever benefits can be uh, extracted from the flow of, of temporal change. And the, uh, the, the consciousness does not have the luxury of abiding in presence because of its paranoid tendency to need to compare the current situation with the past and try to create a, an optimal future. So time, <clears throat> from the perspective of the classical period, is seen as a circle that is entirely present all at once. There is a recognition that when you enter a state of total presence, you enter a higher dimension in which the apparent flow of time is entirely here. There is no past and no future. Even though there is history and there is the apparent shift, but actually it's an illusion because consciousness is present throughout it all and that presence is always here and now. And so all of time is present in every moment in the same way that the entire ocean is contained in every drop. Uh, every, you, you are a microcosm of the macrocosm but all of your past and future lives and, and all of your experiences are present in every moment if you are silent and still enough to perceive all of that information. It's there, but it's too subtle for the ego mind, which is chattering, to pay attention to. And this is why information can be drawn from the so-called Akashic records. It's simply the, the, the information of the entire uh, kalpa that is entirely present in every moment if you pay attention and you know how to decode that vibrational frequency in which it is contained. So presence is the key to liberation because presence is non-duality. And so this is why meditation is the path, the key uh, to attaining the liberation that is always here because in fact there is no one needing to be liberated since the ego is a fictional entity. And so because you are not the ego, you only believe you are, you are actually that total presence. Uh, as soon as that belief is dropped, the uh, goal of liberation is recognized as being your natural state and, and, and it could not be anything else. So this is the, the understanding that we must uh, be able to fully grok in order to be liberated from uh, not simply the illusion of impermanence but the fear and desire 
that the ego is based on as its effort to overcome its lack of being, and which it can never do. So a presence is the only medicine to overcome that uh, endless journey through the illusion of time that uh, can never reach fulfillment until time itself comes to an end.